Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. Yeah, I know this was well, this was due the week of the fourth, but there was far lots of fireworks going off, and honestly, not good recording conditions. So, before I get started, a quick reminder: the day you're supposed to set off the fireworks is the fourth of July, not the first, not the second, not the third, not the fifth, not the sixth, not the seventh, the fourth. If you have any fireworks left after the fourth, you're doing it wrong. If you're sitting off fireworks before the 4th, you're potentially ending up with not enough fireworks for the 4th, so you just wait. J just don't light the fireworks, wait. It's not that hard. Okay, that aside, so it's been a month after E3 ended. I'm not being timely, I know, but still. We still need to talk about the bad stuff. The stuff that wasn't cool. The stuff that didn't make you excited and want to run down to GameStop right away and pre-order, oh, say, The Last of Us, and that sort of thing. No, no. We're talking about the stinkers. The stuff which, in short, you wanted to like, you came in anticipating seeing, or might have been something you've been interested in picking up, but then you saw the E3 demo. You saw the coverage, you saw it in the press briefing, and you went, Ugh. I'm not talking about stuff like Wonder Book. I'm not talking about stuff that ain't aimed for us. I'm talking about stuff which we might have liked, could have liked, but ultimately they dropped the ball and they unsold us on it. Here is my bottom five. Number four, tie between Wizardry Online and Dust514. I know this sounds like a cop-out, but I have the same problem for both of these games, but for different reasons. In short, both of these games are absolutely perfect for griefers. Wizardry Online's problem is that the game features always-on PvP, combined with permadeath, and non-instance dungeons. In other words, when you go into a dungeon, there will be other groups of players going through the same dungeon at the same time, and they can ambush you at any time, say if you've come, in out, come out of a boss fight and beaten a tough boss, and then take the loot that you got from the boss. Furthermore, after they've killed you, there is a distinct possibility that your character will be permanently killed, and you will have to re-roll a new one from scratch. Now, honestly, I have no problems with each of these things in isolation. Always on PvP with no corpse running and no permadeath means, okay, if I die in the course of a dungeon, that's okay. Um, or, do or get ambushed and ganked by a PK, that's fine. My character still exists, I still have my loot, I'm alright. If my if we have non-instance dungeons, that's okay too. Heck, I'd even be okay with non-instance dungeons and PvP just without the permadeath. Because in this situation, there's still possible that, yes, you go in a dungeon, you get ambushed by a PKer, and you have to fight your way out of the dungeon, or whatever. Or if you're killed and you lose the stuff, oh well, I have to run through this fight against the um, creature or whatever again. The problem is, by having the permadeath in here, without any sort of insurance stuff like what they have in EVE, this means that when you die, when you're killed by a PKer, this means there's a distinct possibility that you lose all your work due to circumstances that are completely beyond your control. You are a level 10 or level 15 character going at a dungeon at your level, but it turns out there's a group of griefing P uh, P PKers who are sitting in the dungeon and who ambush you, and they are well above your level, and there's nothing you can do to stop them. You die. That's it. That is, frankly, not cool. I do not appreciate this in game design. This this unsells me on the game entirely. It makes things far too easy for people to grief the game and make it so that it's unplayable for people who just want to play this game and have fun. I get the impression this game was originally created in Korea or Japan and was popular there. However, I also suspect the gaming population there is, pr as far as the um, culture, related to griefing and so forth, it's very different than what we have in the United States, which is why they presumably didn't see the impending massacre of noobs coming. Yes, there are penalties for PKing, but they're actually relatively minor. All they mean is that you are basically 
segregated to the essentially low sec area, which they refer to as the slums. But you can still go to quests, you can still go to all the same dungeons and that sort of thing. And that does not make me feel like there's any sort of real penalty there. It just means that, say, a guild or whatever that's more PK-focused, possibly based around a site like, oh, something awful, basically like Goon Swarm, could theoretically take over the slums and then just go along janking anyone who decides to do a dungeon run because they can. That worries me. Dust 514's problem is similar but different. Specifically, your faction's access to orbital support, as far as like airstrikes and that sort of thing, is based on what factions in EVE Online have ships around the planet in question. Theoretically, the idea behind this, this will lead to more conflict in EVE Online as well, with different factions fighting over different planets. The problem is, is well, there's the elephant in the room, by which I mean Goon Swarm, which, from what I've gathered, basically is the 500-pound gorilla in EVE Online. You, if you go out against Bolt, um, Goon Swarm, you're dead. You can't win. Your faction will be destroyed. Your monies will be taken. Your space bases will be blown up. And basically, you might as well just start rolling new characters and just sit around high sec for a while. But from what I've heard, even that ain't safe. So, what this means is for Eve Online is that since there's probably only be a, a limited number of planets in this game because of your your map stuff, unless you're doing procedurally generated terrain. What's going to happen is Goon Swarm could very easily just park around one of the planets in the setting and then just start either A, having their side win all the battles and just bombard the crap out of their opposition on the planet's surface, or B, if they decide they don't want to get into Dust 514 but still want to grief people, is they could just bombard everyone. You spawn and you are immediately killed by an airstrike from orbit from from Goon Swarm, who has absolutely no horse in this race, they don't care about who wins, they just want you to f feel frustrated and not have fun. And so, basically, whoever wins, actually, though there's no one who wins, it's just Goon Swarm. So, both of these I am unsold on. Number three, Gears of War, Judgment. Gears of War 3 has definitely the best story of the trilogy. And after I heard that there was a prequel coming out for it, I was looking forward to the answers of the questions that that game raised, as well as some of the unanswered ones from the first two games. Stuff like, for example, what is the tie between Adam Phoenix and the Locust Queen? How did the humanity first get, con get in contact with the Locust? What about some of these strange, mysterious products that we see throughout the game, like the weird precursor stuff? Those are things which we will not see answers for in Gears of War Judgment. Instead, we have a prequel story based around Cole and Baird, two characters who are supporting in supporting roles for all three games of the series, and which, in short, means that no questions will be answered, because if they were answered in this game, then they wouldn't be questions in Gears of War 1 through 3, so we're just kind of stuck spinning our wheels from the narrative standpoint. Heck, I don't even, even if we decided not to answer any new questions as far as about the ones that were told in the story and go on stuff like, okay, talking about the Pendulum Wars, a game based around that would have been fine too, but instead we're focused primarily on the Locust as far as, as them being the primary antagonists. So this is definitely a case of just more of the same without any of the new gameplay elements from the later games, and without any new questions being answered, possibly new ones being asked. I'm out for this one. Number two, Dead Space 3. Dead Space, the first one, creeped me the hell out. The environments were incredibly, incredibly creepy. The ambient sound was excellent. The story was tense. The monsters were horrifying. It was an excellent horror game, and I need to go back and play through it again and maybe do a review of that. Dead Space 2 is also definitely on my two playlist because of how it expands the story while still maintaining horror elements. Dead Space 3, not so much. 
We are on a planet now, as opposed to in space, so we have none of the interesting zero-g stuff from the earlier games, it looks like. And we have human enemies that you're getting in cover-based gunfights with all at Gears of War. Th this disappoints me a lot. This is, like, radically different than what I expect from a Gear from a Dead Space game. It's more... It's just not looking good. I'm I am really concerned about this game and whether this will be the successful horror game that I want it to be. Number one, Tomb Raider. Well, here's the biggie. In the last few years, video gaming's toughest, most independent female protagonists have been, well, having badass decay. Perhaps the most notorious example of this is Seamus Aaron who in Metroid Other M went from an independent woman operating outside the system as a bounty hunter to a woman so dependent on a man's approval that she wouldn't take actions to save her own life without a man's okay. And now, Lara Croft is also getting, for lack of a better term, downgraded. In an article on Kotaku, um, it was published after E3, but close enough that the interview likely occurred during E3, we learned that the developers have a bunch of terrible things happen to Laura Croft during the game, so that we want so that we, the player, will want to protect Laura. These things included a attempted sexual assault. After a storm of outcry, Crystal Dynamics, the game's developers, slammed into reverse on the sexual assault aspect of this, like a drunken frat boy who realized he propositioned a cop's underage daughter in front of her parents. However, this didn't stop defenders from bringing up in the wake of this, waving the banner of artistic expression and comparing the outcry of detractors to censorship and misandry. No. No. F that noise. No. Look, I understand the importance and value of artistic expression. I understand how people act bizarrely to works of art. I've read about the painting Nude Descending a Staircase getting unveiled and the riots that ensued after that. For those who haven't seen it, it's Cubist, so no actual nudity there, or detail or anything. I've heard about how Igor Stravinsky's ballet The Rite of Spring led to also to riots. And oh, that's the one from the di with the dinosaurs from Fantasia. That one. Um, there's a ballet that goes with it that involves primal sacrifices and that sort of thing. But this isn't one of those times. First, first thing to get out of the way: getting pissed off at your artistic expression and saying no, you're wrong. Saying I'm not going to financially support it. Saying that you are a bad person. Not even, not even saying you're a bad person, but just. Getting upset about your artistic expression isn't censorship or isn't crawling, crawling your free speech. Free speech doesn't give you the right to artistic expression without consequences. In f indeed, numerous great artists have risked riots, jail time, or social ostracism for their work. Howl, Allen Ginsberg's classic poem, you know, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, howling naked, that one. That got Ginsburg and his publisher charged with obscenity. Honestly, social criticism is the price you pay for being an artist. Screaming, help, help, I'm being oppressed. Now we see the violence that's inherent in the system. Screaming that when your work is justly being criticized for being misogynist or sexist doesn't help your case. Doesn't show that you are a artist. If you're an artist, you take it. You go... You let your work of art stand on its own, if if indeed it is truly art. But you're not being threatened with criminal charges. You're not being censored by, you know, government censors. You're not facing FCC fines or anything like that. Save the charges of censorship when you're actually being censored. This isn't a book being banned. So don't act like it is for those who are defending this game. As it is, rape isn't something you should put in your work lightly. I mean, like, work, any work of art. Music, literature, painting, stage play, opera, whatever. Don't use it lightly. I heard this in several different places from several different people. And it bears repeating. When you include the act of rape in your story, 
whatever it may be, ask yourself one simple question. Does it need to be there? What does it add to the story that any other act of violence would work just as well as? Um, would a physical assault, a beating, a near-death experience, would a... Uh, would the mer for your character's roaring rampage of revenge, would coming home to find their family killed, would that serve just as well for a, a motivator for their attempted revenge? Just ask yourself to look at your work and say, what purpose does this serve that any other act of violence wouldn't? Um, because the thing is, rape is a traumatizing experience. I fortunately for me, have never experienced this firsthand, but I have read plenty of feminist blogs talking about rape, and now oh, far too often it is, it is unfortunately trivialized. But the thing is, it's a, it is a traumatizing experience. People who are raped suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Maybe not 100% of the time. If you point out someone who didn't get PTSD after being raped, that doesn't invalidate that last statement. But people who are raped can get post-traumatic stress disorder, and sometimes that that can be triggered by depictions of rape. So first ask yourself, is there a port do you want to make this unviewable for a portion of my audience? And a not and a sadly not statistically insignificant portion of the audience. Far too many people have been raped than I would like, by which I mean the number is greater than zero. This isn't helped by the disgustingly poor treatment that women in geek culture have been treated with recently. When Jennifer Helper of Bioware suggested that games should have a story-focused mode, with instead of having your combat sequences like in Mass Effect and Dragon Age and that sort of thing, instead focuses, focuses entirely on narrative cutscenes, dialogue trees, and that sort of stuff, she was not only sub subjected to the scorn of the gaming masses, but she was threatened with rape, repeatedly, online. Now, before anyone in the comments claims that these threats weren't serious, put yourself in helper's place. There's no way to know whether they were serious or not. These people are being absolutely anonymous. These people could be living in her town, in her state, or they could be on the other side of the world from her. These people could be normal, law-abiding citizens who have a poor sense of proportion and entitlement about, well, you know, video games, or these people could be absolute sociopathic lunatics who would actually try to rape her. She doesn't know this. She doesn't know who these people are. So expecting her to know this is being a bit of a jackass. As an aside, Helper's idea for how to do a video game isn't a terrible one. Indeed, it's a model that has worked well before. By which I mean, it's been used by, well, Japan for the whole idea of the visual novel. If you've seen the anime series Steins Gate or Chaos Head or anything like that, the ones which aren't based on porn games, those are all based off visual novels. Successful visual novels. Ones which tell interesting and entertaining stories. You can tell a great story in visual novel form and still have it count as a game. Um, for that matter, Chunsoft had their murder mystery game series of which they made lots of these little adventure games for the NES, Famicom, sorry, um, and various other console systems back in the day, and that made Shunsoft a lot of money, enough to make them one of the, not to say the, the best game developer of all time, but brought them enough success that they could leverage this into Dragon Quest and making one of the most popular role-playing game franchises in possibly the history of console gaming. More recently, Anita Sarkeesian of the gaming blog Feminist Frequency announced that she was going to do a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for a video series discussing how women in video games are depicted by examining the archetypes for female characters. She ended up being bombarded with death, death threats, rape threats, public shaming, complete with a fake media Wikipedia article being made depicting her as a slut, and massive cries of misandry by perhaps some of the most privileged people in the gaming community, middle-class, Caucasian, neurotypical males, before she even had a chance to say anything. She hadn't even started making her videos yet. She'd just done a Kickstarter campaign. These are people who are so offended by the thought of a woman speaking her mind that they would attempt to intimidate her into silence. And this didn't even stop there. After the backlash from this harassment led to Sarkeesian's project getting funded 
well above and beyond what she was actually asking for, one of the people harassing Sarkeesian put out a flash game, which has since been taken down, where the objective is to beat Sarkeesian to death. And these very same people cry artistic expression, which I've already discussed earlier, when people object to the transformation of Laura Croft, one of gaming's toughest, most independent women, the female Indiana Jones, into a rape victim, or near-rape victim, and basically leading to a game where she's surviving not through her intelligence, her wits, her toughness, but by instinct. By sheer, blind instinct. A woman with no character save a thousand yard stare. That's not a character with any real driving agency. Adding to the insult in all of this is this whole bit from the article about wanting players to protect Laura, with, with the developer saying, and I quote, They're more like, I want to protect her. There's this sort of dynamic of, I'm going to this adventure with her and trying to protect her. There's a term for this in Japanese pop culture. Moe. That's right. All those clumsy, cute maid girls and so forth from anime who, who describe the bland female lead they're infatuated with using fraternal terminology and who are clumsy and all that other sort of stuff tempted to be endearing and sickeningly, sickeningly sweet. Yeah, they're all playing off the same impulse to make the audience want to feel sensations of not only adoration and attraction, but also a fraternal or romantic desire to protect these characters. It is like a more objectified and potentially incredibly creepy version of the manic pixie dream girl archetype. Moe genre, they succeed and they get appeal for their characters without having them be victims of rape. The developers know better than to go that far. The writers and artists of these series know better than to get into this. I mean, yes, in the 70s and 80s, you would see comedic sexual harassment. Indeed, I remember hearing about one episode of the original Cutie Honey, where the title character is nearly raped. But Japanese society has, over time, gotten more enlightened in what respects is... What, what depictions of women are acceptable. There's still ways to go there. But you generally don't tend to have women in, for lack of a term, lighter games appearing as rape victims outside of either deconstructions like um, School Days or actual porn. I mean, the School Days game was kind of close to porn, but anyway, we're getting off track. Crystal Dynamics, on the other hand, has decided to take these admittedly objectifying and still sexist stereotypes from the Moe genre, and instead of having the character be comedically endearing and all and clumsy and all this other stuff to attempt to pull on the player's protective instincts, it's had to replace those character elements with trauma. With, again, trauma, not any sort of actual character elements, but terrible events which happen to the character. In The New Yorker, writer Karina Chocano, I'm sorry if I, if I messed up your name, she claimed that we are burdened with a plague of strong female characters. I'll find the article and put a link in the show notes. I respectfully disagree. Um, Chocano claims that this is, that this that these characters exist solely for men and they do not appeal to women at all. But the thing is, I have seen plenty of women who have found appeal in characters like uh, Korra from the latest um, spin-off of the Avatar The Last Airbender series. I have seen plenty of appeal to characters like Buff Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, or Princess Leia, or God, uh, going back to Buffy Faith, or Storm from the X-Men, or Wonder Woman, or I could just go on. Or going to the anime genre, um, oh gosh, name fell in my head. The um, Celtic from Dura, or the Major from Ghost in the Shell. I can start l listing off strong female characters who have women who are who like these characters and who find appeal to them. And the point is, we're not experiencing a glut right now. Quite to the contrary, we have. Like of the past few years or months, yeah, years, we've only I could maybe list a few the number of strong female characters who really stick out on like one hand. Um, we got Black Widow from the Avengers and Iron Man 2. 
arguably, um, what's her face from the girl with dragon tattoo? Um, and I'm running out. I'm really running out. Maybe, maybe, but probably not really. Maybe, maybe Stephanie Plum. But again, I, I'm running low. It, it's not that we have a glut. It's that we've gone from a zero number to a non-zero number. We need more of a non-zero number. We need more of a non-zero in film. We need more of a non-zero in television. We need more of a non-zero in video games, especially video games, considering that this is a genre where the player has agency, and the player is controlling this strong female character. And thus, the, char the player is supposed to identify with this strong female character. Not wants to protect them or anything like that, but identify them. I feel for I, I I am making the decisions and acting as this character. We haven't gotten that many who aren't like you know situations where it's a character choice where, where it's like Femshep. Yes, Femshep is a very strong female character, but she exists because in character generation you decided. I'm picking a female character instead of a male character. Same sort of thing with the Elder Scrolls. Same sort of thing with um, not Alpha Protocol. I didn't have a choice for a female character in Alpha Protocol. Same with, same with Diablo 3. In those games you control a female character who is strong because you decided to go fem roll a female character at character generation. That's different, and I certainly say not the same from creating a character like, oh, say, well, by having Laura Croft be a strong female character who survives on an island stranded, surrounded by nasty cultists, not based on pure survival instinct, but based on her intelligence, her wits, and her courage. And indeed, this is kind of what we need. I uh, mean, frankly, well, I'm glad that this misogyny and this sexism in gaming has been getting called out. I'm glad that people are finally noticing this and saying this is a bad thing and we should do something about it. It's demonstrated that at this time, we need more strong female characters who are driven by something other than pure survival and driven by something other than being a victim of trauma, of rape, and that sort of thing. We... We can't have nice things. This is why we can't have nice things. Because we have all of these nasty elements in our gaming society who feed off of depictions like this. And who, who, who make the jokes about, give me a sandwich. Who, when they're playing against women online, um, tell them to get out of the game because they're a woman and therefore they can't compete. Who shout down women critics of video games because they're women. Not because they're not because of anything they have to say, and indeed before they have had a chance to say it. We need to buck this trend, and one of the ways of, of of others that we can do this is by having female protagonists who are actually female protagonists with agency, intelligence. We need a Laura Croft who has who is realistically depicted in terms of proportions. Who has who shows intelligence? Who shows wit? Who shows courage? Who shows independence? Who can do this on? Who can survive and get through this on her own without needing help from a man or anyone else for that matter? If we wanted to go that way. And if game developers really want to be edgy and different and break from the curve, they would give us more protagonists like that. Because we are running out of protagonists like that. Seamus Aaron isn't that anymore. Laura Croft clearly isn't that anymore. Um, and a lot of female fighting game characters are kind of just there to have Gynax bouncing. So, honestly, because of this, because of how we have turned Laura Croft from admittedly a strong female character as a sex symbol to... Ni to neither a strong to neither one neither a strong female character nor a sex symbol just a bland victim with no agency or anything of the sort I am giving Tomb Raider the award of shame of the show now if if you're looking to make gaming a little less vile for women 
if you're looking to push back against these influences of misogyny, sexism, and attempts to victimize women in our hobby at this time, there's a fundraising campaign going on on Indiegogo for a project called Sending the Message. Basically, the purpose of this project is to help create safe havens in gaming to push back against the, 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 the vile and the vileness. Um, to create the, these locations where women can play games online safely, where women can discuss games online safely, where the communities are moderated to make sure that when these hateful influences come in, they are pushed right back out, in the hopes of gradually, over time, shifting the discourse and pushing back so that really, this is a hob becomes a hobby that is safe for everyone. Not just for guys, for women, children, gays, lesbians, minorities, you name it. And basically the idea about this project is to point these groups out, to give them badges to demonstrate on these sites, so that when women come and access them, they see the badge and go, okay, this is a community that is safe, that I can be in and not have to work being told tits or get the fuck out. This is something worth getting behind, and I'll be putting a link in the show notes. At the time of this video recording, there are 15 days left to fund this project. They have already achieved funding. In fact, they are looking for overflow goals. So hey, if you want to get in on the overflow goals now, over, or overflow rewards, now is a great time to do that. Particularly, again, if this is a project which you feel that you can get behind, that you feel you can support. I think it's a cause worth funding. I've donated. I hope that you'll do the same. So next week, or next time, depending on when this comes out, let's talk about something more positive, more cheerful, more qu something with quality to it. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at a book, so time for a book review. I'm going to take a look at Arthur C. Clarke's classic science fiction novel, Rendezvous with Rama. And until next time, I'm Count Zero, and I'd like to thank you for watching. Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. Yeah, I know this was, well, this was due the week of the 4th, but there was far, lots of fireworks going off, and honestly, not good recording conditions. So, before I get started, a quick reminder. The day you're supposed to set off the fireworks is the 4th of July. Not the 1st, not the 2nd, not the 3rd, not the 5th, not the 6th, not the 7th, the 4th. If you have any fireworks left after the 4th, you're doing it wrong. If you're sitting off fireworks before the 4th, you're potentially ending up with not enough fireworks for the 4th, so you just wait. Just don't light the fireworks, wait. It's not that hard. Okay, that aside. So it's been a month after E3 ended. I'm not being timely, I know, but still. We still need to talk about the bad stuff. Um creature or whatever again. The problem is, by having the permadeath in here, without any sort of insurance stuff like what they have in EVE, this means that when you die, when you're killed by a PKer, this means there's a distinct possibility that you lose all your work due to circumstances that are completely beyond your control. You are a level 10 or level 15 character going at a dungeon at your level, but it turns out there's a group of griefing PK uh, P PKers who are sitting in the dungeon and who ambush you and they are well above your level and there's nothing you can do to stop them, you die. That's it. That is frankly not cool. I do not appreciate this in game design. This, this unsells me on the game entirely. It makes things far too easy for people to grief the game and make it so that it's unplayable for people who just want to play this game and have fun. I get the impression this game was originally created in Korea or Japan and was popular there. However, I also suspect the gaming population there is, pr as far as the um, 
culture related to griefing and so forth is very different than what we have in the United States, which is why they presumably didn't see the impending massacre. The stuff that wasn't cool, the stuff that didn't make you excited and want to run down to GameStop right away and pre-order, oh, say, The Last of Us, and that sort of thing. No, no. We're talking about the stinkers. The stuff which, in short, you wanted to like, you came in anticipating seeing, or might have been something you've been interested in picking up, but then you saw the E3 demo. You saw the coverage, you saw it in the press briefing, and you went, Ugh. I'm not talking about stuff like Wonder Book. I'm not talking about stuff that ain't aimed for us. I'm talking about stuff which we might have liked, could have liked, but ultimately they dropped the ball and they unsold us on it. Here is my bottom five. Number four, tie between Wizardry Online and Dust514. I know this sounds like a cop-out, but I have the same problem for both of these games, but for different reasons. In short, both of these games are absolutely perfect for griefers. Wizardry Online's problem is that the game features always-on PvP, combined with permadeath, and non-instance dungeons. In other words, when you go into a dungeon, there will be other groups of players going through the same dungeon at the same time, and they can ambush you at any time, say if you've come, in out, come out of a boss fight and beaten a tough boss, and then take the loot that you got from the boss. Furthermore, after they've killed you, there is a distinct possibility that your character will be permanently killed, and you will have to re-roll a new one from scratch. Now, honestly, I have no problems with each of these things in isolation. Always on PvP with no corpse running and no permadeath means, okay, if I die in the course of a dungeon, that's okay. Um, or, do or get ambushed and ganked by a PKer, that's fine. My character still exists, I still have my loot, I'm alright. If, if we have non-instance dungeons, that's okay too. Matt, heck, I'd even be okay with non-instance dungeons and PvP just without the permadeath. Because in this situation, there's still possible that, yes, you go in a dungeon, you get ambushed by a PKer, and you have to fight your way out of the dungeon, or whatever. Or if you're killed and you lose the stuff, oh well, I have to run through this fight against the curve. Noobs coming. Yes, there are penalties for PKing, but they're actually relatively minor. All they mean is that you are basically segregated to the essentially low-sec area, which they refer to as the slums. But you can still go to Quest, you can still go to all the same dungeons and that sort of thing. And that does not make me feel like there's any sort of real penalty there. It just means that, say, a guild or whatever that's more PK-focused, possibly based around a site like, oh, something awful, basically like Goon Swarm, could theoretically take over the slums and then just go along janking anyone who decides to do a dungeon run because they can that worries me. Dust 514's problem is similar but different. Specifically, your faction's access to orbital support, as far as like airstrikes and that sort of thing, is based on what factions in EVE Online have ships around the planet in question. Theoretically, the idea behind this, this will lead to more conflict in EVE Online as well, with different factions fighting over different planets. The problem is, is well, there's the elephant in the room, by which I mean Goon Swarm which, from what I've gathered, basically is the 500-pound gorilla in EVE Online.